Kathy Leibel. It is always such an honor and a treat to be here in the Dog Center. Um, uh, it's such always an inviting space, and um, I, I love having conversations and dialogue. This is just such a wonderful place, I think, to sort of be able to interact and ask questions. I'm really hoping to get a good conversation going. It is actually my great honor today to introduce and then moderate a dialogue with three of the most significant journalists and, in my opinion, moral voices of our contemporary moment. All three men have spent the last several decades going to some of the most dangerous, violent, conflicted, vibrant, and beautiful spaces in the world with the purpose of recording stories, lives, and asking with urgency and compassion for the rest of us to stop and listen. Many of these stories are not easy to hear. I personally remember an article from around 2000 by Anderson about Angola and oil companies that I had to stop and start over four days because I simply could not take it all in at once. Telling hard stories and taking hard photographs, as Nickelberg and Wallace have done, is one thing. But making readers keep reading, making the viewer be incapable of looking away, that's the real talent of the three people we'll be talking with today. Urgency is hard. It demands that the reader and the viewer participate and feel engaged. And that is, in fact, rare. And again, it is a great honor and a treat to get to moderate a dialogue today about their work. To give a full and proper introduction would take literally all the time we have today. But as a quick introduction, John Lee Anderson has been a staff writer for The New Yorker since 1998. He has reported from across the globe and is the author of such books as The Fall of Baghdad from 2004, <coughs> The Lion's Grave, Dispatches from Afghanistan from 2002, and Che Guevara, A Revolutionary Life from 1997. Robert Nicholsburg has worked for Time Magazine as a photographer for over 30 years. He too has worked across the globe, starting in Central and South America, then Asia, and then the Middle East. He published A Distant War in 2013 about Afghanistan, and his most recent book is Afghanistan's Heritage, Restoring Spirit and Sp Stone from 2018. He is currently a fellow at the Cary Institute for Global Good in New York. And then finally, the man that has brought us all together is Scott Wallace, newly a professor of journalism at UConn, and by that I mean that he arrived here in 2017. His amazing work is on exhibit, and soon we're going to look at a video. Um, but I want to actually just say something more um, personal, which is that if you haven't had an opportunity to read Scott's latest articles in the National Geographic about um, uh, uh, the tribes in the Amazon, it is really critical reading. Um, and I would urge you to go and take a look immediately. It is, these articles are smart, they're devastating, they're insightful, and again, they are urgent conversations about what we see, what we cannot see, and who has and does not have the right to be seen, which is beginning to feel to me to be the most sort of pertinent human rights conversation that we can have about visibility and invisibility in this moment. Um, as Glenn uh, uh, pointed out, I'm going to sit on the stage. Um, I like to think of it as more like a sort of, I don't know, Merv Griffin style uh, <laughs> dialogue. Um, and I'll ask you a few questions and then um, uh, we'll open it up to the crowd. Um, uh, and then I think we want to get a video kicked off. Leftist rebels. The Cold War is still on and the U.S. fears the Soviet Union is trying to establish a communist beachhead in the hemisphere. I arrived straight from journalism school with press credentials from CBS News, which provide a kind of passport into the heart of the conflict. Attention to Ray Vincent Salvador, where right-wing death squads have re-emerged to threat and kidnap labor, religious, and university leaders. The U.S. is pouring millions of dollars in aid into El Salvador to reform the government and vanquish the guerrillas. But human rights abuses persist. Death squads ply the nighttime streets, abducting and killing suspected opponents of the regime. Twelve members of the local civil defense force were executed, some yanked from their homes unarmed. An entire family perished when the rebels bombed their house. I soon realized the story that interests me the most 
is out in the countryside. That's where U.S. advisors are training recruits in Vietnam-style <coughs> counterinsurgency warfare. It's where the rebels are on the move, devising new tactics of their own. And most importantly, it's where the untold stories of human drama are unfolding. My name is Rosa Miriam Quijada from the northern province of Chalatenango. She became a widow this week in a cruel tale. Reporters covering the war here have come to regard as routine. More experienced reporters take me to the field and show me the ropes. I learn where I'm likely to find the guerrillas, where the army may be operating, and how to coax information from frightened civilians caught in the crosshairs. Salvador's for CBS News, San Salvador. The Cold War lens blurred the vision of those who looked through it, and it tended to obscure a deeper truth. Cold-blooded killing was taking place on a large scale. Entire communities were being ripped apart by the violence. I came to realize that we reporters were serving as valuable conduits. The people wanted the outside world to know. They wanted their stories to be told. There's fear everywhere, said one. We're scared to death. We've been through too much to go back. Eventually, I moved to Nicaragua, where, again, the U.S. was fighting a war by proxy. <coughs> Here, the U.S. was arming and directing the Contra rebels, seeking to overthrow the revolutionary Sandinista government, backed by Moscow. Specially trained battalions swing through the mountains. They circle the rebels, then hammer them with mortar and machine gun fire. It was harder to find the war in Nicaragua. It was taking place deep in the interior where the Contras were staging deadly ambushes on military and civilian targets. As in El Salvador and neighboring Guatemala, the human toll was staggering for a country of this size. <coughs> Tens of thousands dead or injured, hundreds of thousands more displaced by the violence. According to witnesses, several hundred rebels moved into the hills surrounding the hamlet late Monday afternoon. The people of Central America today are still living with the consequences of those wars. I think we owe it to ourselves and to our Central American neighbors to remember what happened there just a few decades ago. It's really the only way to understand the current immigration crisis on our southern border. And by remembering, perhaps we can also avoid such tragedies altogether in the future. Uh, 
uh, terrific sponsors here, the Yukon Libraries, uh, Archives and Special Collections, and um, its archivist, uh, Graham Stinnett, who's done a wonderful job helping shape the vision of, the, uh, of this um, exhibit, especially in the gallery room there. I urge you to go in there later and look if you haven't had a chance to yet. Um, Yukon's Office of Global Affairs and Vice President for Global Affairs, uh, Dan Wonder, thank you so much for your support and thank you for being here today. Really uh, appreciate your uh, vote of confidence in this project. And um, Dan is one of the people among the many who have really welcomed me to Yukon. And I'm so grateful to be a part of this community um, for all the people who are here today and so many of you um, who have helped uh, me get find a home here in Yukon. Um, there's also the uh, other sponsors, I should mention, uh, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and Interim Dean, uh, Davida Glassberg, El Instituto, uh, and its director, uh, Samuel Martinez. Thank you so much. Um, the uh, Department of uh, literatures, uh, cultures, and languages. Gustavo Menclares, the head of that department, has helped uh, with this project. Uh, digital media and design uh, as well, and their director, Heather, thank you for being here today, and thank you for your support. Um, and last but not least, uh, the Department of Journalism. Um, I have the, uh, had the great fortune of having the best department head um, that anyone could hope for in Maureen Croto. And um, thank you so much uh, to Maureen for supporting this project, for supporting me. Uh, I have such a terrific group of colleagues in the Department of Journalism, and I'm really proud to be a member of it. And I'd like to thank Maureen um, personally for that. Maureen actually um, became the chair of the department the same year that I went to El Salvador. And um, so we kind of started out in different paths, but we're here together now. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so uh, I also would like to uh, acknowledge a couple of the students who have really helped make this. First of all, I have awesome <coughs> students, thanks to all my students. But two students in particular, uh, Jake Roberts and Jacob Bureau, who have um, made, seen this project through to its completion, and it couldn't have happened without them. So thank you very much to both of them. Um, I just wanted to say, um, also in my department, among all the great colleagues and friends, I have Stephen Smith. Uh, who's our visual storyteller, really helped shape the vision for, the, um, for this project. He helped me kind of turn the chaos of all those images into something that makes um, some, somewhat coherent sense. Um, I have a couple of special guests visiting today. My partner and fiance, Meg Walsh, from Washington, D.C., and my eldest son visiting from Los Angeles, Mackenzie Wallace. Thank you so much for being here. And, um, and then um, I would like to, for any faculty members who are here, I know, I'm sorry, I'm taking too long. Um, but uh, I am available for the next month while this exhibition is hanging. If anyone would like to have a, bring their classes and would like a tour of the exhibition, um, you know, if there's any language classes in Spanish, I'd be happy to take them through in Spanish or any of the other departments. Uh, this is a multidisciplinary approach, and um, I'm just get in touch with me, and I'd be happy to arrange a time when we could. Um, take your classes through because I feel like first and foremost this exhibition is an educational tool and this is as this event is as well so um, with that the last thing I'd like to say is um, I'm delighted and honored to have my two old friends and colleagues um, Robert Nicholsberg and John Lee Anderson here today um, Alexis will tell you a little bit more about them but um, or you already have I guess uh, but I just wanted to say that, you know, besides the fact that these are both incredibly accomplished journalists, award-winning journalists who have traveled the world and have um, reported the kind of stories that Alexis was talking about, we, we all got our start together pretty much in Central America around the same time. Uh, Bob was the first one to take me to, to the field and show me the war. Um, and for, you know, from the first day I went out in the field with Bob, we were uh, in this kind of dicey area and coming into a town that was uh, controlled by government, pro-government uh, civil defense forces. These guys with kind of steely eyes and, you know, um, the, yeah, not very friendly uh, demeanors. And we pulled up at their checkpoint 
and rolled down her window. And the first thing Bob said to me was, take off your sunglasses. It was a, like, you know, kind of like the first lesson I learned in like, you know, how you operate in a situation like that. But it's not just in, in, in this particular situation, but it's just showing respect, you know, and, and diffusing potential uh, <coughs> suspicion by meeting somebody's gaze directly and allowing them to see you in the eyes. It reminded me much later on in Baghdad, I noticed that no U.S. soldiers would ever show that kind of respect to the local population. Um, no, but none, none of the U.S. troops ever removed their sunglasses in the personal interaction that I've witnessed with the Iraqis. And maybe, you know, maybe that kind of connection as we look as journalists, the important connection <coughs> with locals. Um, maybe if we had done a little bit more of that in Iraq, it might have been a little bit different there. Um, John Lee, I first met in, uh, in eastern um, El Salvador early on in the, uh, in the conflict. I think I was coming out of, uh, I was on an army patrol and we just crossed uh, into a town on a, on a road and John Lee had just pulled up in a car with some other colleagues and he, uh, yeah. They were covered in mud, as I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and so. <laughs> so anyway, it's my uh, pleasure and honor to have him here today. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I feel a bit like I'm on stage with superheroes, so I'm going to ask a very superhero-oriented question about your origin story. Um, how did you, and I'm asking this again, my final question is going to be about the students in the audience who maybe want to meet you. So how did it start? How did you decide to do this for a living? Uh, back in the late 70s, I started to watch the slow collapse of the Somoza regime in Nicaragua. And had been living in Washington, worked for uh, unemployed, uh, collecting unemployment, in fact, but also working for a congressman doing his photography and uh, doing some freelance work for the OAS publication, Organization of American States. And finally, when it got to be uh, quite delicate for Somoza in the United States, whether they were going to continue to support him or not, and you could see that the Sandinistas were getting closer to the capital, I decided I needed some credentials and wanted to go down there to see if I could illustrate foreign policy. That was my intent. Little did I know that I'm still trying to illustrate <laughs> foreign policy. Uh, but I had a credential, at least, from Organization of American States, and uh, went to Costa Rica and went up the, to the northern bound, uh, border of Costa Rica and Nicaragua. At that moment in time, in Managua, the ABC television reporter on camera was executed by a member of the National Guard. And was clear that things were not going to go well uh, for American policy or journalists in fact, at that particular moment. So everybody fled, the press corps fled Managua, and I was left on the southern border of, of Nicaragua, with, uh, which we, we did see Cuban officers who were training Sandinistas come out of the jungle and make their move towards Managua. Comandante Cerro, Eden Pastora was there. So, from there, I started uh, sending film to Newsweek magazine, who was, the magazines back then were very open for freelance uh, supply of film. So that's essentially, and oh, one thing I should remember about being a freelancer, I handed in my bill, I wrote my invoice out for the managing, for the director of photography at Newsweek, and on paper in longhand, and I handed it to him, and he looked at me, ripped it up, and said, write another one. And I doubled it, meaning what I submitted was too little. And that was the sort of things were the days. <laughs> the deep pocket uh, sort of contradictions that we have today. But, yeah. Um, so I took a year off when I was a, an undergraduate. I took a year off and went to... Um, Central, but actually to South America. I went to Mexico and South America and learned Spanish. I, I, I 
got a job um, uh, teaching literacy uh, on a mission in the middle of the jungle in Peru. And I went to a language school in Mexico first to learn Spanish. That really changed my life. I mean, the, the, the speaking of another language, encountering in depth another culture, really made me, sensitized me to another world. And I realized there was a world that we as Americans did not know much about. And we were having a tremendous impact on, uh, on, their, um, on their lives. And so that was the first step for me, I think. I eventually, I, I, came, I went back to college. I didn't really know what I wanted to do yet. But I was I doubled up my Spanish courses in the last couple of years, learned how to read it, write it very well. And, uh, and then and finally, I was like, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I, I actually put on a three-piece suit and went for interviews for you know um, management training positions at commercial banks in Manhattan. They all turned me down. Uh, and uh, and eventually I was like, well you know I love to travel. I love to take pictures. My father gave me a camera when I was very young. They we had photography books lying around the house. Love to travel. Love to take pictures. Latin America fascinates me. I have this kind of phobia about bosses hovering over my shoulder. And uh, I sort of finally thought, maybe I can like, become a foreign correspondent and photographer and go cover like, the wars that were heating up in Central America. I went back to journalism school, got a master's in journalism, and I went straight to El Salvador right out of journalism school. So that was my intention. So that's how it started. <laughs> I cut that a secret. <laughs> oh, the shipping company. Oh, I did that too. Is it? Right. No. Yes. No. <laughs> okay. No. Three green lights. I'll just speak really loud. Can everybody hear me back there? Okay. Um. I had a more circuitous route, but I got there nonetheless. Oh, there it goes. Um, so uh, oh, now on. So I, I, I grew up all over the world. Um, my father's in the Foreign Service. My mother wrote children's books. Um, I lived in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and at the age of, and so I had this notion that I would write. Um, but also, um, I was drawn to adventure. <clears throat> so I never lived in Central America, but when I was thinking of what Bob was talking about, the revolution against Samosa. It, I was about 20, 19 or 20. I didn't know a hell of a lot about the Sandinistas, but I knew that Samosa uh, seemed to me they could be of evil. And I had spent my 18th year uh, living in Honduras on the Mosquito Coast, working as a machetero for a dollar a day. I learned my Spanish essentially working as a peasant with a kind of uncle of mine who took me to work anyway. And Nicaragua was next door. So it was a, it was a formative year, and I, I think I became quite political. So I, I wanted to join the um, but I didn't know how to. And uh, long story short, I didn't end up becoming a guerrilla myself, although that's what I, so I certain period of time, that's what I wanted to do. And I found myself drawn to Central America because I wanted to, uh, same reasons as my friends, you know, it was the four, it was the front stage of history at that moment. Um, this was the, we call it the Cold War, but this was the hot war of the end of the Cold War. And, um, and I also felt a, a kind of moral imperative to be there, to <coughs> bear witness, sounds a little highfalutin, but I wanted to see history, I wanted to live it. And I, I guess I was drawn into journalism for a combination of those reasons, of mm. sort of wanting to witness history, wanting to live it, wanting to wanted to wanting to live it with my own flesh and blood, um, feeling very uh, a strong sense of social justice mm. uh, and the injustice of what seemed to be taking place. We were just too young for Vietnam, so this was just a few years later. America was intervening again, but surreptitiously, in a new part of the world. Many of the American officers, one of whom we saw there, had, their last posting had been the end of Vietnam. This was just seven, eight years later. So, anyway, I, I went to um, to live in El Salvador to uh, start reporting. I was streaming for uh, 
for time. But part of but part of the part of the decision was to uh, to live in war, to experience that. The things I had on my list of to do list ever since I was a kid. I'm not talking about bucket list now, but I had this to do list, which was go to war, <laughs> row across the Atlantic, climb Everest by the age of eighteen. Be a Welsh coal miner, you know. Like I, 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 it was a very hit and miss box ticking over the years, but war I definitely achieved. And, that was what I achieved with war. and again, both Bob and Scott are associated with my early days in El Salvador. Uh, Bob, I met the first or second day I was in the country, and he had just lost his uh, one of his very good friends and sidekick the day before in a gun battle. So he was also in uh, John Hoagland, the photographer, whom I'd met a few months before and went off. And, uh, and, and Bob was still working. He was work out working the next day with his camera. And it was a very stoic guy and someone you wanted to be with if you were leaving the capital into the countryside where the World War was taking place. And he was on one of my early sallies outside of the capital where you know, driving battle towns, suddenly there were some soldiers who appeared out of the bush and there was this muddy character. Scott Wallace with a big smile and that's how we met. <laughs> yeah. So that was that. And anyway, fell into journalism. Never really looked back, I guess. Let's talk a little bit about um back this. <coughs> you heard a little bit more, but um could you talk a little bit about what it was like, you've already sort of hit on this, but what it was like to be a journalist there. How, where did you meet, I mean, you've already sort of said how, you know, muddied on the streets, but it seems to be, uh, I want to know a little bit more, and I think we all want to know a little bit more about the sort of community of journalists. How do you, like, you, you each told actually very similar stories about just sort of showing up but once you show up, what happens? Who takes you on? How do you get work? How do you know? Because if, if I understand it correctly, were all three of you basically freelance when you arrived? Yes. So could you talk a little bit about what that's like? Like when you get a plane ticket and you show up to a place. The ABCs of it. Yeah. yeah. How do you, what, what is that like? What was it like there and then? And were there, how many of you were showing up on planes to take photographs, write stories, and fight? It, it's a valid question. I mean, uh, I often look back and say, how did I get in the Time Magazine? In the door, when people uh, would actually pick up their phones, you could make an appointment and go see people, but uh, at the same time, socially, also your network in New York City, for instance, where I was living. Uh, I knew the Time Magazine photographer currently in El Salvador at that point. He, he had enough uh, and was about to pull out, and he sort of said, well, I'll turn it over to you. And that's, that, that's a very impressive version of it. So I was introduced. And in photography, film was what you wanted from magazines. Uh, camera equipment was your own, and uh, a cash advance. So I was introduced, handing it over to you. I don't get enough uh, Well, that, that's one way to get rid of a photographer. Give the money in film and they'll leave. Uh, different from pens and paper yeah, stuff. Right. You know, so. Uh, in any case, I moved and took up an apartment in, in San Salvador on a, and eventually, within a year, had a contract So it's, uh, as a vendor for time and uh, shared the apartment with the time stringer, who was actually staff, or soon to be staff. So we had a mini bureau, and the bureau for all of Central America was Mexico City, but to live in El Salvador was doable. Uh, total immersion and busy, because people coming out of Miami were regularly showing up at television stations, CBS, NBC, ABC, Reuters, AP, all had permanent offices, 
So there was a constant flow of information. Those were our friends. You would start at 5.30 in the morning, calling up the UPI office, uh, press International, find out which towns had been taken over. Or, right, if a town hasn't been, uh, hadn't collapsed to the rebels, you could go find death squad victims. And between those two options, your day started out interesting. And uh, we had a chance in unarmored cars, just a rental Mitsubishi four-door uh, to go down most of the roads. That was the unimpeded, issue. with a press credential if necessary, but a cigarette would also work at some point. If you didn't smoke, you needed to talk more smoothly, but at least have cigarettes to give away, for instance. <laughs> so I'd have to send film back in a pouch once or twice a week. So it would have to go from the, the airport to Miami, Miami to New York. So it, it was at least 24 hours to get film back. And then they would process it in the building, uh, shot two cameras of color, one black and white. So there was often a lot of material moving up and in coordination with the writer. And eventually you establish a rhythm for the narrative. That was particular to the magazine business because you could move photographs for newspapers, all the bureaus. So in it's in Salvador where I, so I, I made the decision that I was going to go like Bob did. I made the decision I was going to go to El Salvador. Having made that decision, CBS put it, gave me a test. Can you do radio for us? And they wanted me to do a test. I passed that test. They gave me a press card and gear, recorder, microphone, and everything. So a month out of school, I showed up in El Salvador with gear and press credentials from CBS, which allowed me to start filing for CBS right away. Um, and, you know, we kind of gravitated. There was, I think, a certain, you know, you could feel people out, and you kind of had a sense of, like, who the other journalists were, who you felt, you know, a certain sympathy with, who sort of got things in the same way you did, or, you know, you understood, like, as John Lee was saying, that, you know, Wow, who you could sense was a kind of guy you wanted to go to the field with. You know, he's the kind of guy that knows the ropes and can show you how to, you know, uh, it just had a, you know, there's a certain sympathy you feel for somebody. You get a sense. So eventually, you know, we sort of, there was a group of us that we, you know, became close friends. And I think we felt a particular affinity and didn't feel that necessarily, particularly with some of the journalists who were parachuting in from, New York or Miami, who tended to, uh, to to depend more on the U.S. Embassy for its, you know, orientation and for its sources, whereas the resident journalists, <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, the resident journalists, we were more out in the field, and, and we had, I think we had a big advantage because we were um, we had a little bit less tether. We didn't have to. I didn't have to be, you know, for the most part uh, tied to a deadline, a daily deadline which gave me more freedom to go out in the field and see what was really going on with it. Yeah, um, I finished up after spending a year. I, I, I was also living in Washington and made quite a few, I made several trips down, um, 81, 82, and, um, to various war fronts and was writing freelance dispatches. And, and I, I was in Nicaragua, Guatemala, mostly. The early Contra War, and there was sort of death squads, and did some investigative work, and based on that, I decided I wanted to be down there. And so I got a, I called up the uh, Time Bureau in Mexico City, and uh, they hired me as a stringer, um, which means in those, it meant in those days that you're not you're not staff, you have no benefits. But <clears throat> I worked it into a kind of what they call a super stringer role, where they gave me a house car, because I got my own car all shut up, they got me a, a Land Cruiser, or a, which I bought on the black market, actually. And, um, and they let me roam around the region. So although I lived, I lived between Honduras, which was where the Contras were based, and El Salvador for, uh, in the time, and, and I worked with Bob because he was the time photographer. And, um, so I would sometimes go off and do stories where I had a lead, 
and because the bureau chief was a, was a guy, he liked me, you know, he, he, let me he gave me free reign. But I had a lot of frustration because the administration, the Reagan administration at the time, as he was, was prosecuting this war, and the actual uh, chairman, <coughs> editor-in-chief of Time at the time, was a very conservative, very anti-communist guy, and an Austrian or Hungarian refugee guy, I gather. I found out later from the bureau chief that he, he had lunch every Monday with Henry Kissinger. So, uh, this was this apropos of my stories getting spiked. I kept finding out things that our side was doing and getting increasingly frustrated because that clearly wasn't what uh, New York wanted to hear uh, and wanted to report. So I came, I, I, it took me a couple of years to realize that this was the case. Um, there were two, there was also two kind of, the press corps was divided into two groups. There was the Monago Press Corps, where Scott eventually ended up. So they were living, you know, with under the with the with the beneplacito of the Sandinista regime, which was under the gun of the CIA and the American government, and essentially had to kind of reported within Nicaragua. They were less mobile. So there was a few people that came out, and then there was the, was the rest of us who were based in El Salvador, which was very much. A U.S. based <coughs> and roamed out from there. And the, those who came from Nicaragua to El Salvador were immediately under the scrutiny and suspicion, and sometimes worse, of the El Salvadoran intelligence forces. A few got killed, and I, so there was there very much this kind of Cold War feeling as well. So Scott, Bob, and I all knew each other. But there was a period in which Scott was living in Managua, and we'd meet up. But it was like living on either sides of, let's say, the Berlin Wall. In, in, in a sense, sense, yeah. In a sense. It's like North and South Vietnam. Oh, right. right. Exactly. So um, we roamed around. What was, my, what was I going to say? I, you know, you, you develop camaraderie. And much as my friends have said, you know, you know, in general, journalists help one another. If a youngster pitches up and they're green and they have no experience, but they're there. Most of us who are older and more experienced and aware of the risks will try to help them out. The last thing you want is someone to get hurt because they don't know the ropes. Um, and, you know, um, uh, so, you know, one of the bureaus would, would pick people up. We, we had a good rapport with the locals. I mean, I'm still good friends. I think we all are with the Salvadorans we worked with. In your case, the Nicaraguans we worked with. Um, we formed a real bond with, with the people there. And we had, it was kind of the us and them of the parachutists who came in from Miami or New York for a few days of stand-up and left again. And then there, were, there, there was us, uh, who were the community that was, that was resident, but had to deal with the powers that be in the place. It wasn't easy. Um, we haven't mentioned Guatemala, which is a yeah. different beast, a very covert, sinister, dark, mysterious, Civil War simultaneously going on and exactly. growing. Most industrialized country in Central America and a very big concern to the CIA. And that was a place that the American Embassy, Pentagon, State did not want us to really cover mm. at all. And some of the worst atrocities. Right. Oof. The you could never get to. And uh, again, I, I fall back onto the trying to. To help the audience, you couldn't get to because it was deep in, and the military right, so was not road. You're up to six thousand feet, seven thousand feet. Some of these mountain villages, like a ski area, and very hidden. Uh, one road in, one road out, and the government was very disciplined and ruthless. Uh, so many innocent people were just kicking the door, spray, spray the room with bullets, or in one case, a church had too much food around Easter. <laughs> that. The, the military showed up, locked all the doors, and burned the church. Everyone people inside, with people inside, yeah, and you could only hear about that. You could never get to it. El Salvador was very uh, open. We could go down at three o'clock in the afternoon, go two hours down the shoreline, find something going on, and come back for dinner. I mean, not to to make light of that, but it was accessible. Uh, and we had uh, laissez-passer. We, we, 
you show them a credential and you can either speak to the guerrillas or not, or speak to the military or not. But I think access was increased the longer you spent as a resident there. And it helped to hunker down. Can I ask about being an American journalist and how that well, you, affected access? I mean, what was then your relationship to the press force? Other that's a really interesting things? question. Um, if you don't mind, I'll, yeah. you know, uh, because the United States was so involved in these wars and was funding, you know, it was essentially the Salvadoran government would have collapsed had it not been for these massive infusions of outside aid. The Contra rebels in Nicaragua would not have been able to exist without massive infusion, infusions of um, aid and direction from, you know, the, from the CIA, clandestine resupply flights flying over Nicaragua. Those, the, the countries that we supported could not, uh, or the third side, the U.S. support could not, you know, uh, maintain this war without massive support from the United States. Therefore, and the interesting thing was that we, American journalists, actually had this kind of interesting pivotal position where everyone knew that what really mattered like, was like U.S. public opinion, and we were in a position to shape it. And so all sides were willing to speak to us. Or provoke. Yeah. Yeah. Provoke or advocate. Yeah. So it was really extraordinary in that sense. Um, and, you know, even if you were, like, reporting on the side that was the U.S. enemy, say, the guerrillas in El Salvador, or the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, by and large, those groups who were supposedly our enemies were more friendly and less threatening to us than the people that the U.S. was supporting, the Salvadoran military and the Contras, um, who were, you know, uh, yeah. I was just going to add something to what you said, to, for, you know, for the... For the audience, a lot of you are young, and to, to give you a sense of the kind of a, a, another bit of context, as I mentioned earlier, that this is the next uh, co conflict or area of confrontation after Vietnam, which was, remember, it was a defeat. Americans pulled out in 75. So, the end of the 70s, the rest of the 70s was the Carter administration, and it was all a kind of mea culpa, a kind of reckoning with what had been. The Reagan administration represented a kind of um, make America great again. Make America great again. It was it was it was a football mentality. It was, it was, now it was like we're back and we're winners. You know, all the movies during the '80s were bringing back alive Chuck Norris or Rambo films. It was, and all of the Vietnam films had to do with a, a, an American hero type going back and kicking those goops asses. That was basically what the films were, about. and that was taking place while. We were in El Salvador. We, we would see it, the effects of it, on, say, Salvadoran troops. You know, Rambo with three would play in San Salvador, and there would suddenly be soldiers dressed like Rambo, or calling themselves Rambo. They were uh, contras, too. And it, was, it was very much this kind of, um, it didn't matter about right and wrong. It's a word here, and we're going we're gonna to kick ass. Excuse me. And um, for the journalists, we were the first, essentially, uh, we were the first American, a generation of American journalists that operated <coughs> in a war zone in sometimes, not intentional, but in, in, in actual antagonism with our nation. You have to remember that Nixon was brought down by journalists in, was it 1973, Watergate, you had the defeat in Vietnam. So our generation was pretty skeptical of the powers that be and of the establishment, not all. We had plenty of, you know, plenty of uh, colleagues who had, you know, would just go to the embassy for the five o'clock follies, or like, as, in, as they call them in Saigon, or the, the embassy briefing. But we, uh, there was a lot of us who were questioning, who were skeptical, and who didn't just accept at face value what we were being told. So we were trying to operate, not embedded, not embedded with our own forces, which had been the, the, the convention for war correspondence since the Crimean War. Most war correspondents went out with their their national army and were embedded very often wearing the uniform of their army and in many cases carrying a weapon as well. And this happened right through World War II and Korea and I think in Vietnam, not necessarily the weapon but the uniform. So we were not uniformed. We were trying to operate between all sides. 
And we all have friends who were killed, not just caught in crossfires, but also murdered for doing what they were doing. So that was the cautionary note, despite the fact that Bob, that Bob, was, Bob was saying that, and it's true, that we could more or less operate. But this, this, had, this came and went, depending on the commanders at the time. We were swapping stories this morning. You know, uh, there were the Dutch journalists who were apparently beaten to death and killed because they were trying to go through no man's land to meet the, the guerrillas and the army made it look like an ambush. And their room was tapped. And a couple of years later, a similar thing happened to me. But I managed to survive. <coughs> After interviewing the commander, I went further and then he arranged an ambush, claiming that it was, he had word that it was foreign terrorists. So, after, after a while, uh, the journalists would put TV and big tapes, uh, tape letters on the top of their car because the A-37s of the Army, you didn't want to be mistaken, you didn't want to be bombed, but there were plenty of occasions when journalists would come back saying, Jesus Christ, and I had the TV on my car and I was driving, and they strafed me, they rocketed me. And I think a couple were killed like that, or got badly wounded. So you never really knew what was going to happen. And, uh, but the Americans were on top in the sense that your passport did mean something yeah. then? Yeah. And you could actually say where you were from and uh, sort of stand up, not patriotically, but take some pride in it. Right? Whereas right now, you might <laughs> want to say you're Canadian if you're caught out, <laughs> or, or Costa Rican, or just say not American. So it's turned that way. And contemporary journalism is also whole environment's changed, but you asked about as an American, uh, the embassies were trying to play the media the best way for them was to say, come on over for dinner, or you want an interview with the ambassador, or an off-the-record interview. And as a photographer, I go because we needed information. Uh, there was no picture there for me, but we needed to hear what the Americans were thinking. The Cold War has been mentioned a number of times, and in some ways, I think that there's a the historical dialogue is exactly the one that you've been mentioning that there was Vietnam. That this seems like another another sort of way to fight this other battle that was going on, this Cold War. How did you make how did you make your stories not simply this is the second Vietnam? This is another war front. But how did you create a sense of specificity against what I'm assuming was an overarching desire by what you all said to sort of create a generic rah-rah narrative that was about the Cold War? How did you pivot that to talk about this being the war of this moment and about this geography and this people who are not Vietnamese, who are not you know, in Indonesian, who are not all of these other sort of ways in which I would say the U.S. government and also sort of large journalistic enterprises were attempting to make this sort of just another playground for this battle between the United States and Russia. How did you make it specific? The Americans helped us uh, with a coup in Chile. Um, clearly, with levers from uh, foreign policy, the bully coming down with commands, demands, having the School of the Americas in Panama back then and training the senior officer corps uh, of all Latin American countries. And they therefore are not necessarily indoctrinated, but they saw that, the, uh, that their ambitions in the, within the military could be successful if they aligned themselves with the Americans. I don't think we had that same kind of uh, training or offer to the Vietnamese military. They tried, but the language, the cultural differences. But certainly, with Spanish-speaking diplomats and military trainers and the intelligence operation, could engage Latin American countries differently than let's not have a repeat of Vietnam. That would come into the discussion. Well, I think those journalists, one of the things that I kind of aimed to do, I think all three of us did, was to really humanize the situation that these people whom we were writing about, photographing, talking to, these were real people. And, you know, we're, I think, in, in, in my particular case, 
Um, I think we arrived in El Salvador with the thought, yeah, this could be another Vietnam. It sort of had, you know, the, the, the tropical sense, the anti-communist message, the helicopters, and but, um, you know, I think we were thinking that maybe we could avoid the same kind of tragedy if we did our job reporting the real stories on the ground as the Salvadoran people or the Nicaraguans were experiencing it and, and it made this really specific to this human landscape and not just the contest between Moscow and Washington. Yeah, I mean, I think for us the, the Cold War aspects were really kind of, it was the backdrop of the world at the time, so we weren't, it wasn't something we channeled every day. Um, we, we, we saw what was in front of us. But you have to, you know, the, the backdrop here is that the U.S. was doing a lot of stage management. The, in the initial part of the Salvadoran Civil War, they, um, the death squads, in the, you know, the oligarchy, the army and the death squads just went crazy, killing people. They had lists of people that needed to be eliminated. They eliminated them, they included the Archbishop, you know, Romero, now made a saint. It included you know, American nuns who were believed to be communists. It included the 800 to 1,000 people in Mosote. Around the time we're in El Salvador, just a year or two later, these were the great unmentionables. You couldn't talk about the Mosote in the U.S. Embassy. There was not an official acceptance that it even had occurred. And it had occurred, and there had been American journalists who witnessed it and taken photographs of the af aftermath and had then been sort of forced to leave the country. It not only had it occurred, but it had occurred in the hands of a just freshly tra uh, trained U.S. counterinsurgency battalion, U.S. trained counterinsurgency battalion, <coughs> one of the first, like for maybe the first. Yeah, uh, okay. And um, it wasn't something you could bring up. Um, that was the kind of, that was the mantle that was hanging over all of us when we were there. And it wasn't the kind of thing you could bring up in a, let's say, in these uh, press briefing at the embassy. If you did, you'd be pegged as a, a communist, and you wouldn't get any access. If you did it at a Salvador military briefing. Yeah. Quick story, 1985. Colonel Monterosa, his picture is in one of, Scott has pictures of him there. He was the darling of the press corps. He was the one friendly commander of the press corps. You could go to San Miguel, that was where I was on my way. I was to be taken probably by our friend Bobby Block to go meet him. Because he was the one commander. All of the others were hostile. They would call you, they regarded us as subversives, you know, agents of the, of the terrorists <coughs> or worse. But Monterosa was friendly with the press and he, you know, he'd take he'd go drinking, he'd take you out to dinner. Well, but he was the guy rumored to have carried out Mosote. And this was three years later. So in October, it was 84. 84, 84 rather, 1984, Bob and I spent three days with Colonel Monterosa uh, on a, a counterinsurgency operation, what they call, you know, heli-transported. Anyway, we were run around in helicopters. He would periodically shoot, guerrillas, they would shoot. And we arrived in a town where the guerrillas had been, and he had, uh, had taken off. We were in the town. He disappeared. All the time I was with Monteros, it was interesting. Time Magazine loved this guy. They, all, they just wanted to know about how we were making El Salvador more democratic. They didn't want him to know anything about Mosote. But every time I met him, I was in thrall. I was, in, you know, and horrified at the idea that this man had done this. And, and yet, you couldn't bring him up. Somehow, it was the great unmentioned of them. It was as if you were with a, you know, someone who had a, a third eye, and you could never mention the third eye. <coughs> so, long story short, Bob and I were there when he, when he came back from, he went off into the cemetery of this guerrilla held hamlet, the had melted away, and he came back looking very elated about an hour later, half an hour later. I happened to see him come out of the cemetery, I was hanging around, came up and he said, I said, what's the matter for we know, what's up? And he said, I found the rebel radio transmitter. This was, everybody knew that he'd been looking for the rebel radio transmitter. They had a propaganda channel. Radio, 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 radio
voice he, of the He had been trying to get it to silence it for years. So he found it. He said, I found it. And I said, this is my moment to talk to him. So I said, Colonel, can we speak? And he said, and he was suffused with emotion. He was really excited. And I said, tell me about Mosul. And he, he wouldn't meet my gaze. And he said, it's not like they say, which meant that it had happened. It was for me, it was a confirmation. And there was maybe a little bit more, but anyway, he got up and went away. Long story short, Bob being the guy, in the, Bob being the senior journalist here who was like knew when he had to dispatch film to, um, to, uh, to back to New York, pointed out to me, I think it was later that after, we were planning to stay with one of another couple of days and this thing, it was pretty exciting, you know, this idea of, I felt like I'd finally gotten close to the guy. But he reminded me, this was Wednesday perhaps, and, and to get his film or my story, I didn't know what I had yet really, um, to New York. In those days, you know, there was, there was no cell phones. If you were lucky, there was a telex. There was no telex in this little girl hamlet. We had to go back to the regional capital and get a bush plane back to San Salvador and, and check in with the powers that be. And we were going to fly back the next morning. We agreed we'd push back the flight a couple of hours. There were these little planes that would go back. And at some point that morning, that next morning, Bob called me and he said, guess what? They just blew up on Perosa. In the rebel radio transmitter that he found, they'd hidden a bomb. And, and he got put it on the helicopter along with you know, 12 other people, including some people who really deserved to get blown up. And the guerrillas were waiting in the cemetery Boom. and doing Boom. That story's on one of, the, one of the panels out in the home. So, um, with the picture. Because of Bob's insistence on being professional, we weren't on that chopper, but also. <laughs> and, and Monte Rosa took his confessions to the grave. But um, Very often you could get, jump onto the colonel's helicopter if there was one or two seats. So thankfully it was overloaded that day because so many people wanted to go to see that radio station. The radio station was like hearing Stephen Colbert you know, ridicule you from a place that they couldn't find him. And mobile radio, was they mobile. were always moving around. They would criticize and joke internally with nicknames and rumors about cheese bits, about the past or some girlfriend that a colonel had just to stick it in. So they really wanted to get him. And they really wanted to get him. For, is what he yeah. Yeah. They also wanted to kill him. Yeah, the, 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 the revenge for my, uh, my brother. I'm going to pivot a little bit because yes. I want to have time for questions yeah. from the audience who I know will have yeah. a ton of very specific questions. But, but I wanted to sort of end on a more sort of general note and ask you about from the moment that we've been talking about to the sort of moment that we are speaking about now in contemporary journalism. Um, the one thing, and again, this is specific to sort of my position as an art historian and somebody who uh, uh, deals with visual culture, there seems to be an overwhelming amount of information that what the internet has provided is um, different voices, different you know, angles, different, you know, that we don't have to depend on what Time Magazine will allow us to know. But on the other hand, um, my ability to see is so much less because I can't get through it. There's so much information. How has that changed your ability to tell your stories, your ability to, to take the photographs and make people see in a way? I mean, it seems like on the one hand, you have much less, you had much less control over that you could send stories, but you couldn't depend on what would be published. You couldn't depend on what photograph would John, make you it. should take this since you're on deadline with something at the moment. Yeah, probably. but how do you how do you control uh, uh, your voice and how do you get your story out in this media environment? Well, uh, okay, I'll go back quickly to that period because, I, as you can tell, I was evincing some frustration with, you know, in my case, it's different for photographers. You know, there's a kind of purity to the image they take, and well. You know, sometimes you might think you took a better image, or, but anyway, it's explanatory in a news magazine like it was, like that magazine. In my case, 
it was my one chance to deliver the the reality of the country I had lived in. And usually I found myself exactly at odds. It wasn't of ideological. Um, it, well, actually it was ideological, but it wasn't in my case ideological. I felt that I was there to report the truth. And I found that what they wanted was some slice of the reality that wasn't the whole truth, or even really part of the truth, and certainly didn't inform the readers of the unfolding reality, and especially the emotional and psychological reality of that. They only wanted elections, and, you know, they wanted very idiosyncratic stuff, which was, a, which was a real, I think, a problem for me, and I eventually, I left time to go, you know, go off to different countries and do my own thing. But um, I found it so frustrating that, that because of the experiences I was having in the field, I had very I had an ethical and a moral imperative to let this, to, to in some cases, impart what I, what I knew was happening. And if I couldn't do it in the magazine that I worked for, I tried freelancing a little bit. I could, I, I, free, I did a couple of stories based on experiences of the conscious for the San Diego Union, a couple of times for the nation. And I found myself giving information because I knew, I knew things that were happening. Uh, to Human Rights Watch uh, as an anonymous source because it wasn't coming out any other way. And I had privileged information. I couldn't walk around. And I think that's something that we haven't talked about that's important for anybody who's planning to be a journalist to know is that there's something that comes with the territory. It's not if you're going to be a basketball correspondent, but if you're going to go to war, nobody prepares you for the ethical and moral quandaries you may find yourself in literally the very next day. Someone's dying in front of you. Do you help them or do you take their picture? We've all been in those situations, or worse. Um, you know, you, there's a multiplicity of situations you can find yourself in where you're morally challenged. And if if you manage to get over that hurdle and do the right thing and be an actual human being and not just a reporter, you, it's then your imperative, your ethical imperative, to to tell that story somehow. Hopefully, not get any, any other people killed or more people killed. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's complicated, but um, it, that quandary led me to leave uh, time and eventually find a way to tell stories that were more fulsome, where I was more independent. Um, I eventually found myself working, you know, for the New Yorker. Where, sorry, where, you know, in, generally speaking, I do what I want. <laughs> because if you have the length and they <coughs> pride themselves on the depth, and this is true of some other publications as well, and a certain, uh, no, no, nothing's objective, but a, let's say a dispassionate or impartial, more impartial effort in telling the story, then as a journalist, I feel more satisfied with the end result. But it's never perfect, it's never perfect. And, and, and just quickly, to this business of you know, how, how everything's changed, it's become more complicated. Um, instead of, I think it's, instead of being, it's, as you point out, you know, we live in a tower of Babel of information, and yet we see it reflected in our politicians and, and in society at large. People seem, it's going from a knowledge-based society to some kind of faith-based society. And I don't mean that necessarily as a religious faith, but you know, um, stereotypes, you know, know nothing. Um, this is what I believe because I want to believe this, and so we're we're living in that sort of time. So we're we're all very challenged um, in terms of getting our message across. And the only message we really want to get across is the one we started out trying to get across <coughs> when we began journalists, which was to tell the story of our time as honestly as we could for the benefit of everyone else who couldn't be there. And I think that's what we still have to try to do. And difficult, but it's, it's the only thing we can do. Yeah. Totally agree with that. I mean, the, the fundamentals of journalism have not changed. You know, we're still um, committed to, you know, just bringing home the story, sharing that story with the outside world, sharing that story with the, with the public, um, and hoping that, you know, um, our stories have enough authority in the ring of truth because of the thoroughness with which 
we approach our stories and deal with our subjects and our sources, um, that's really all you can do, I think. I mean, we're not, none of us are in positions of power where we actually own a media outlet where we might actually, you know, be able to, you know, fund a, a channel to take on, you know, Info Wars or Fox News or whatever. But, you know, we, we do our jobs and, 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 and hopefully we'll attract the audiences that recognize what we're doing, um, you know, for genuine, being genuine journalists. Yeah. The web is allowed to go laterally rather than continually focus on for images. I can put 20 up on a website or take two in Time Magazine, but what's your choice here? A both actually would be nice, but uh, and it's not been properly monetized for the visual side to make a sustainable living on a regular basis. The web has complicated that, but it certainly has improved our ability to get pictures out to more people and I'm now the editor very often. What I send out uh, makes a difference because very rarely will they say, no, we're not seeing it. Uh, please send us more. <coughs> and very often when that happens, there's an old uh, cliche, if you send them too many pictures, they'll pick the wrong one. And it'll be out of focus and scratched you know, for film. But, uh, I think it's opened up other opportunities, but it's presented def definitely a rhetorical challenge to whatever we send out. Thanks so much. I think we should open it up to some questions. Um, uh, yes, in the front. <laughs> so first of all, thank you all, and um, especially thank you. You can expect my email tomorrow. Uh, Terrific. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> question has to do with the influence of Vietnam on us as journalists and, you know, did that impact um, our, our approach? Um, I think absolutely in my case. I mean, I was very much aware of the Vietnam War. Uh, I had done a paper in graduate school about the press war in Saigon in 1963, pitting the residential journalists against the, you know, the guys who were coming across for a few weeks from the States and depend on U.S. sources. I could see it happening again in El Salvador, pretty much. I think it's really interesting. One of the things that I'd like to stress here is that Central America, these wars are really the bridge between Vietnam and the Middle East. Right. The road to Baghdad led from, you know, from, from Saigon led through Central America. All these guys who were involved in the planning and execution of the war in Baghdad, the run-up to the war in Baghdad, the propaganda about Saddam Hussein, they all trained in Central America. Some of them had been in Vietnam first, and then came to Central America, and then plied their trade later in the Middle East. And um, you know, and some of them are around today planning, um, you know, a possible intervention in Venezuela. Um, you know, some of these people who've been going through these wars and this planning. So I think yes, Vietnam was uh, um, a big influence. I would not, I would not say the gore was something that interested me. What did interest me was trying to do something about it 
and it seemed like this was a place where maybe we could actually, or I could personally bring something to bear that might actually make a difference. That was a, I don't know if people have that sense anymore. Maybe that's one of the things that's changed too. It's much more difficult, I think, to have an impact on policy. I think we still, you know, had the illusion maybe that we could impact the policy by, by our reports. And Central America was that, you know, Vietnam was the last war on Central, I'd say Central America definitely was. Yeah, I would I mean, disagree with the assertion that Vietnam was. It was, it was. No, yeah. she, did, she didn't say it was. Well, you said it was, yeah, uncensored war, right? The Vietnam was the last uncensored war. Uncensored. It was, it was an uncensored. I, I would disagree, and I would say that it was Central America. Mm -hmm. yeah. For the very reason that, you know, Yes, there was a kind of resident press corps in Saigon, and there was a, the odd Michael Hare, but by and large, the war was covered by reporters being embedded with American troops. There was you no know, choice, really. You couldn't go out. Okay, and that's the point, is that afterwards, in the 80s, precisely, our generation were doing, were on the battlefields in places where our government had, was reasserting itself covertly. Covertly, and we were trying to move between both Camps, enemy camps, our our own governments and uh, and the Moscow Cuban supported forces, wh wh with whom there was some sympathy, you know, because uh, our generation of uh, of uh, of journalists had grown up with the trauma of Vietnam and the abuse of institutions by the United States government. Remember, so we were we were skeptical of everything the U.S. government you did. You could not get with Vietnam and Vietnam. So, yeah. at all, you could cross lines once or twice a day in El Salvador and yeah. Nicaragua. Yeah, Nicaragua was more difficult. Well, less so, but in, in El Salvador, Salvador there was this, yeah. a different intimacy. The language certainly, I don't know how many, I doubt very many of the press in Vietnam spoke Vietnamese. Maybe we French was still that. accessible, but in some places, but not in the villages. But we could go to the villages that the militants controlled at night, that the army claimed we had it during the day, but we didn't have it at night. And we had that intimacy, which could go against or certainly provoke a response from the Americans. This is too close to the truth. Excuse me? But, right. Uh, exactly. we had a we're getting shot at by... American bullets from AC 130s. I don't know if you've ever been around one of those things, but uh, a, a serious killing machine. Yeah. And uh, we were also at risk. So we were down on the ground with one side or the other. We had a chance to reflect on both. And we were very aware as journalists that there was a psyops war going on. They call it uh, psychological, yeah. warfare. psychological warfare. So. You know, the fact that you couldn't talk about Mosote, the fact that Haig suggested that the, the nuns, the American nuns who were raped and murdered brutally by Guardia Nacional, had been pistol packing. You know, these kinds of these kinds of really cruel canards that were thrown out there by really people of uh, positions of responsibility, whether it was Reagan or Haig or was Haig. any number yeah, of okay. these other ones. Elliot Abrams, who's now back on the scene also denied, he suggested, that Mosote was communist propaganda. Well, it wasn't. So Im imagine that, if you're a young American <coughs> reporter in the field in a place where the State Department spokesman is suggesting that if you, if you insist on this line, you're, you're in the enemy camp. So we learned early on how to try to negotiate this. We were very aware that there was a PSYOPs war going on. And it wasn't only on the American side, it was also on the other side. And we had to try to figure out what the truth was. So we were constantly putting ourselves at risk to go to the scenes of the battle. In, in Scott's exhibition, there's a good example of that, where he and a handful of friends went to the site of a recent massacre that was simply not um, acknowledged and wasn't never acknowledged. Never officially. acknowledged. And this was the kind of thing that was, you know, um, the, the everyday bread. <coughs> question about desensitization and particularly photojournalism. I remember that one picture in Vietnam of that girl who was running from a name pop attack. And I can't imagine. I mean, that picture had such an amazing impact. And now I get on my Twitter account and once in a while I'll see a picture of a baby dying in Yemen and I think of Aleppo as the first you know, Twitter genocide. There's so much information out there that it's actually become numb. 
So as a journalist, how do you deal with the fact that the information that you have is so flooded with so much with so much information that it almost becomes less relevant? It's like Syria, no one could ever claim there wasn't information. It became meaningless. No, I would disagree. Sorry. Please disagree. Um, I hope you do. I, I, no, I, I know what you're saying, and I was, I, was, I, I was nodding and agreeing with you, but when did the West intervene in Syria? Think about it. I'll tell you when. The West didn't. Well, it did. It intervened. Yes, it did. Well, it was three hours. No, no. The West has intervened in Syria. There are American troops in Syria. It's, this is not a value judgment of when they did or whether they should have or not. It was after the decapitation video of Jim Foley, who happened to be a friend. Okay, and when was the next time that, when did Angela Merkel throw open the borders of Germany to the million people who came in? When a, a photograph of a three-year-old boy pitched up on a Greek shore, face down. Which tells you, and I, I, there's, there's, it's, it's room for a whole other discussion, I would argue that you, don't, you shouldn't make policy uh, decisions of such magnitude whether it's going to war, a declared war, or a declared war in a country, or um, a, a, an incredibly magnanimous but nonetheless destabilizing gesture, such as happened in the, in the summer of 2015 with the refugees, uh, which Europe, Europe is, is, you know, it's had a lot of consequences in Europe, um, and, and we have yet to see the end of that, because of a photograph of a three-year-old who drowned on shore in Greece. That's, that, is, that shows you the power of an image, and of, of, of imagery, of social media. I, I don't know if we can call it journalism, but it shows that our, the, 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 our populations now are, have the ability to be extraordinarily passionate and, and, and move policy based on just raw emotion. I don't think there's an appreciation for yeah. the desensitizing effect of the web. In fact, you, we hit rock bottom before we have a response. Look at Al Qaeda, 9-11, excuse me, I knew something was up with the Arabs in the country. And then to read about the dysfunction between the CIA and the FBI not being able to go after these fellows. The head of that one, the one who directed one flight wanted to get a a license to fly a biplane in Florida with 500 pounds of fertilizer to spray over crops. And it was, he was actually going to load it with uh, explosives. And we didn't pick up on that. Uh, so uh, in this crowd here, the desensitization is not appropriate. But uh, certainly in the population right now, the government is also making of its ability to flood the zone and divert your attention, particularly with the fellow in the White House right now. But, uh, you know, are we inspired? Yes, to go out after these stories. But it's also through anger and uh, the clear clarity is important, too. So you still have to stay on track and try not to get too distracted with Twitters or whatever its source of information, but at the same time, stay focused. Yeah. Yes, to the back. Uh, white shirt, yes. <laughs> so I have a question specifically for Mr. Anderson. You were telling us about how you kind of felt like you wanted to do a rebel effort and you kind of had that antagonism with time and also with the US government kind of spiking your stories. And you kind of come from that of the rebel side and those sympathies, how do you feel like that was reflected within your journalism? Do you think that that perspective came through, and do you think that it was different from some of the other journalists who are on the field? Um, uh, I mean, yes, probably. Um, although, you know, um, uh, I should say, I mean, I said, you know, I. I it was more of an, uh, an emotional approach to life, you know, than than an ideological uh, point of view. I guess um, I I think I grew up, you know, believing in the possibility of a good war and the good war. And if you know, I I think that if the, if 
I'd been of age in the Spanish Civil War, I would hope that I'd gone off and fought for the Republic and against fascism. And so I felt that Somoza, again, going back because of my particular, the life I lived, was, was just an evil son of a bitch and needed to be overthrown. I didn't know so much about the Sandinistas whom I ended up reporting on, and also on the Contras, um, and spending time with both in the field. Um, the moment passed. You know, I wanted to go off and be a fighter, more or less between the age of about 15 and maybe 19. I think that a lot of young men, particularly, are prone to that, or were susceptible. Um, now, maybe they just play war games on their iPhones. I don't know. But in those days, you had to actually go and you know pick up a gun and go shoot people, um, and there was plenty of people that I felt were you know worth shooting. But in the end, I became a journalist instead. I think in the way it reflected for, for may may have reflected for me was merely always having an extra extra bit of time for the people that were in the bush, who didn't have a story that was out there that was legitimated by government or newspapers. Or I mean, the rebels had the rebel radio. They weren't particularly friendly with me in the initially either. You have to win over. You have to win people over. Um, but I was always w willing to hear their story, and so it led me to seek out those who didn't have, whose story was was clandestine, was their history was oral and not written down, and I was keen to find out the stories and the reality is the culture of insurgency, I guess. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it led me to places where maybe other journalists didn't go in a more, in a more longer term way, yeah, I guess. Okay, up in the corner. Um, yeah, um, first of all, just um, it's so inspiring to see this work being done and the um, sort of attitude you guys take to it. Um, I'm wondering, how has, uh, how have you seen photojournalism um, faring and developing as a practice since your time in um, Central America? Um, and how would you counsel um, potentially impressionable young people in this room who might be interested in it? Um, is it still possible to just get on the ground with a camera and figure out the rest from there? Well, uh, it, it's certainly a challenge, I, uh, not just on price per picture that you receive, but uh, what you bring to the profession now is multiple language, ability to speak more than one language, technical ability, uh, different than just how to function with a camera. And your ability to deal with people, how you interview, uh, how you interact with a stranger, for instance, how do you get their picture out, out of the blue, for instance. And it's no different than, say, an outward bound camp where they give you 25 cents and a matches and a fish hook and say, okay, survive tomorrow. Um, try it. Still, one camera, one lens, one roll of film, see if you can put a story together. And if you can, somebody will notice. So I, I with all the downside of uh, not being able to monetize pictures properly on the web, um, you can still succeed. But it's 24-7. It, it's not necessarily at the level of obsession, but it's, it's close. <coughs> And, uh, but again, the ingredients are communication skills, multiple languages, and uh, how, do, how do you tell a story in a literal way and at, at understanding what editors are looking for? So that's a lot, actually, but it's something that I had to learn very quickly. So the learning curve is almost vertical in a situation like we entered, even though there was a much more generous uh, financial backing at that point, for us to make a mistake, you could recover and go back out. But right now, the camera equipment that you need to have, not just an iPhone 10, you know, you need still between cameras, uh, lenses, and bodies, 10 pieces. Uh, 
But again, what you bring to it is uh, an ability to communicate. I would say also, you know, if it's something you're really interested in doing, I would like look, seek out and look at the people today who are working, who are doing the work that you admire. Pay attention to what they're doing and, you know, befriend them. You know, make friends with them on Facebook or, you know, through Instagram or whatever. Let them know that you're really interested in how they're doing what they do. And if you really want to go, you know, figure out a way to go, at least for an exploratory trip and see if you can do it. Um, that's what I would say. But Bob, Bob's right. You've got to know a foreign language, you know, knowing how, basically how to write. Mo you're mostly, good. a lot of people today are going to need to know how to write as well as take pictures and do multimedia. You should have all those tools in your <coughs> toolbox. I would just add one thing, and although it's not specifically necessary if you just want to cover news, um, but if you, if, and that's to, if you have a story to tell, you have an idea of what it is you're interested in. What, why, why you're there. Maybe it's, may, and you know what? It's fine if all you want to do is cover the news. It's like we have friends who are wire reporters. I, I have two or three good friends who never were anything but wire reporters. They didn't want to be novelists or magazine writers or anything. And they were fabulous uh, wire reporters. They had an ability to distill information immediately, honestly, and um, with to great effect for over many years in their life different situations. And there are amazing news photographers who are just excellent at that. So it's good to know, sometimes you just are intuitive and you go out intuitively and you know you, you know, it's a little more amorphous for some of us. But some, it, 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 some people are driven by an idea <coughs> or something they want to tell about the reality out there. What is it you want to do? What is it you want to tell? It's not only about how you're going to get forward or ahead in life and your given profession, but it's like, why are you there? What story is it you want to tell? And that will help you, I think, frame and, and channel your energies and maybe save a lot of time. We have one more, time for one more in the front. I'm interested in an update on your sense of what has happened in Nicaragua over the decades since you were there. I infer from what you said that each of you back then was to some extent imbued with the excitement and the hopes of the Sandinistas. Do, do you feel that their legacy and Ortega's continued presence there has been a, a big disappointment? Do you feel looking back that you can see antecedents to that disappointment that perhaps you didn't see then? Or is being disappointed in the Sandinistas, does that simply mean you're not, you're not getting the whole story and not appreciating what continued to happen there over the decades. Almost all the stories you covered were ones in which the reality you covered was at odds with, with American foreign policy. There are now some happenstance situations, perhaps Venezuela, perhaps Nicaragua today, where if you were covering them, you, you would find yourself less misaligned with, uh, even, even, even if only accidentally, with American foreign policy uh, uh, than, than you were at the time. I wonder, A, what it would be like to be covering you know, what's going on in Venezuela or Nicaragua now, and, and be as part of that, you know, give a, give a kind of Nicaragua thing. Go ahead. Well, um, yeah, I was there last summer. Um, I've, I've done a couple of stories there over the years, in the last five years. Um, I mean, Ortega is, until, until this, this, this year, this past year, I was beginning to look at him and think, this guy has really figured it out. He's the last man standing. He's created a co-presidency, his wife, who's completely gaga. Um, nonetheless, is his vice president and minister of information. She even gives the weather reports. Um, these two have just, they're not going anywhere. And, and they reacted brutally. And I was there for the last stage of the brutality. I, I saw what they did. I saw the hooded paramilitaries. I saw the, you know, the terror they struck. I was in the neighborhoods when those people came in. I saw it. I know that that's what they're doing. And um, they, they simply don't know how to do anything else. So they need to be helped to retire and maybe to depart. Um, it's very sad to see what's happening in Toronto. 
but it's been, it's been coming for a long time. It's, it's not just Daniel Ortega. It's also the private sector who, who connived with, to put him back into power. It was part of the Catholic Church, which used to be his enemy when he was a communist, and also connived with him. So he, he would ban, he would institute um, a draconian uh, abortion bans and, and, and basically t uh, tow the church's line, the most arch-conservative part of the church's line. Those businessmen who once conspired with the CIA to unseat him are now and were now his allies. Um, he's an extraordinary character because he still talks the revolutionary talk, but in fact, um, is uh, is a complete scoundrel. He's a complete scoundrel. His sons, they have I think eight children between them, um, a bit like Gaddafi's sons. They were each given a part of the economy, so they control um, advertising, they control foreign investment, they control all pretty much all media. They closed down. The last remaining independent media belonging to friends of ours just in the last well, they've so, to that time. Yeah, I know three now we're in exile in the last month. Um, but you know what? Ortega was always a miserable guy. He was. I remember watching him give the speech of the fourth anniversary of the revolution. I I'd come to Managua to try to report. And I was hoping to get an interview with him. He was the president. And I had been told I would have one on Friday or something. And the night before, he gave the anniversary speech of the revolution. And he was such a lout. He was so, so uninteresting and such an uninspired speaker. And, and coming out with so many hackneyed slogans that I just, I decided not to interview him. Actually. I left. There were more interesting Sandinistas there. Ortega was just this kind of, um, you know, really lackluster speaker, and, and and over the years I've gotten to know a man who was who was at his side for a long time, Sergio Ramirez, who's a literary figure and was his vice president for years. And he you know, he he talks a lot about what happened. He feels some responsibility for helping help come somehow enable this man, as do many other people. And he you know Ortega outwitted them all. Um, there are people who are far more revolutionary, in a sense, you know, yeah. who had more, you know, a plan, more transformative visions for the country than him. And they are, the, by and large, they have filtered away. Um, one of them is a woman, Dora Maria Tellez, who's now underground. She's she was a, a commandante, commandante um, you know, Sergio and others. It's, it's, it's sad to see. Really so he's, he's basically an opportunist who's figured out how to stay in power. And the society is such, it's so poor in Nicaragua. Uh, actually, I, I, I kind of relearned an old truism going back there for the first time about five or six years ago to do a story. I went into the countryside. You leave Managua, and it's, it's 1970. You know, people, half of the country live on a dollar a day. There's not even any cars. If if they're you know prosperous peasants, they have horses, but people walk. I stopped to give a ride to an ancient lady one day, and she didn't know how to get in the car. She'd never been in a car. She'd never been in a motor vehicle. It's so poor. And I re and the truism that I relearned was that it, you, know, you can do anything to poor people. You can do anything you want to them and with them if you want to. They they're completely you know, vulnerable to you. And that's the story of Nicaragua. This guy who's an old fox has figured out how to stay in power at the expense of this you know, very, very poor people. Um, and it's, in, you know, it's incredibly sad. Um, so I never had the illusions about the guy. Um, I think he's a low-hanging fruit in John Bolton's story of tyranny. They might even leave him for last. Um, it's unfortunate that he is abusing uh, you know, I suppose whatever positive might be extracted from the term socialism. I don't even think he's complaining to be a socialist at this point. And he could well be the last. He could well be, I don't know, all is said and done, he could well still be there. I wouldn't be surprised if they cut a deal with him. Isn't there a slogan like, 
Familia, Socialismo, Cristianismo. Or oh, yeah, they turned Cristianismo. Yeah, they're Christian, yeah. Socialist, and Pro-Family. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It's, 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 um, it's kind of Turkmenistan in the tropics. <laughs> she, the wife, um, it's Feng Shui, five colors. She always wears five colors. I think it's green, purple, fuchsia, pink, and yellow. I could be wrong. All public buildings have to also be bathed in this color, either painted or in electric lights at night. All, it's all official correspondence is in fusion. I mean, it goes on. I could, it, it gets fairly. Garcia Marquez. It gets it's fairly. Right. fairly right. Is you need a novelist. Are you reporting from Venezuela? Yeah, I probably will be there in a couple of days. Yeah. I've been reporting in Brazil most recently. I want to thank the panel for just an absolutely amazing afternoon. So Thank you. Oh,